and welcome uh, to the third UEA Postgraduate History Research Seminar of this semester. Uh, we are a hybrid seminar series, so we're delighted to welcome quite a big online audience tonight and an even bigger audience in the room, which is fantastic. Um, our speakers tonight are actually joining us in person as well. Tonight we've got two former UEA alumni who have gone on to do PhDs elsewhere in the country, so we're kind of catching up with them tonight, which is really nice. Uh, and we've got a very strong 17th century theme for you as well, so I hope that's of interest to you. Um, I'd like to welcome Aresta Mukut and Lucy Morgan, and we're going to start first with Aresta. Aresta is a Midlands for Cities funded PhD student at the University of Leicester. Her work compares the narratives of loss from Ireland, England and Wales during the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. As part of her collaborative award, she also works closely within the National Civil War Centre and she's currently designing an exhibition on Ireland in the wars. So, the rest are over to you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, so today's paper is just a small part of my dissertation, um, which, as Louise said, is on suffering and loss in the wars. Um, and the sources I'm using for this um, are the 6421 depositions, um, which in which Protestant Irish refugees recall their treatment and petitions for relief from England and Wales. Um, if anyone's wondering why Scotland is not included, it's simply because the same soft sources are not really available. So the English Civil Wars have often been seen as unusually benign um, and their reputation as a conflict often was seen as much more strained than the Thirty Years' War, for example. Some historians went as far as to call the wars uncommonly civil, um, although other scholars have more recently argued that um, the, the violence uh, on our islands are quite similar to the German violence at the time. Um, but the truth is, of course, somewhere in the middle. Um, the, the civil wars were not unusually civil, um, but they were also not unparalleled in violence. Although one increasing, increasingly questionable claim um, is that the English civil wars did not have atrocities. Um, so in this short paper, I will explore what was and was not considered atrocious according to the laws of war at the time, um, and then turn to the treatment of prisoners of war. Um, and so historians appear to be in general agreement about what European laws of war were at the time. Um, Geoffrey Parker, for example, identified five sources from which laws of war arrived in Europe. Um, so these are Christian texts. And various movements, such as peace and truce of God movements from 11th century France, and various legal codes, um, and collections of precedents, um, as well as an appreciation of reciprocity between enemies. And similarly, Barbara Donegan um, has done the same for the Civil War specifically. Um, she argued that um, the laws in England were um, standards from religion and morality. Um, usually referred to as the laws of nature. Um, there were laws of war, which were internationally recognised. Um, and there were also internal army regulations that were, of course, slightly different um, for each army. And so laws governing conduct during war would have been familiar to everyone in 17th century Europe. Um, although these remained in Britain, um, laws of nature paired with teachings of various movements uh, work to create an environment where children, women, the old and the sick, um, and also the dead, uh, were understood to be protected from violent military conduct. And so laws of war in the Three Kingdoms and wider Europe constantly um, formalised these protections when it came to rules and conventions of surrender or plunder. Um, but these were also written, of course, um, and yet they were still internationally recognised and followed. Um, the observance of these laws usually relied on mutual good faith um, and fear of reciprocity, as I said earlier. Um, there are a few sanctions um, beyond revenge, um, but this seems to have been enough for most. Um, and lastly, the, the written laws that each army had would have provided disciplinary regulations on more practical matters such as desertion, um, but in this case, um, they also often included moral etiquette um, including the, the banning of and murder of the banning of murder of prisoners. Um, but as with most rules, there always have been exceptions, and laws could be molded to suit circumstances. Um, and there were always groups who were oftentimes excluded from the rights and protections. 
um, the Antioch Moderation War with Irish Catholic uh, people was essentially an absurd concept to many people in England, um, although claiming discriminative butchery in Ireland would also be untrue. And so the nature of these wars is conflict of, as, as, as the title says, three kingdoms, um, provided people with plenty of scapegoats. Um, and whilst I agree that the board conclusion that there was quite a lot of restraint on all sides of conflict, um, when excesses of violence were committed, they were committed uh, against the others. The line between legitimate and illegitimate violence often was unclear due to war goals, often taking precedence over soldiers' morality, um, which also included imprisonment sometimes. And I was interested in treatment of prisoners because it was and remains um, a key way in which people judge the decency of their enemies. Um, this sort of history has a, a kind of timelessness to it. Uh, however, it's it's quite strange, therefore, that um, the recent interest in sort of masculine atrocity um, has not utilised imprisonment very much. Um, so I thought I would have a look at uh, more regular people who were imprisoned. And so overall, I will argue that English and Welsh soldier prisoners uh, were spared their lives, but Protestant settlers in Ireland faced extremely poor treatment in captivity. And this was due to the initial insurgency not being controlled in the same way um, that official armed conflicts were throughout the kingdoms. But although there was a lot of suffering, most of it was lawful. Um, many accounts of imprisonment that I looked at show that prisoners died of poor conditions in prison um, or equally injuries incurred before being captured. Um, there were things that were not unusual, neither in peacetime nor wartime. Uh, Mary Phipps certificate, for example, talks about husband's death and confinement. Um, and she claimed that this was due to wounds incurred in the battle um, before he was captured. Um, so it means that his death could not have been entirely to do with his imprisonment, as he was already injured and would have likely um, died or at least have been disabled beforehand, uh, even if he did not uh, get captured. Um, but there are plenty of examples of widows and soldiers attributing the lack of medical help um, to soldier disablement or death. Um, Sarah from Wales, in her petition expressed the belief that her husband died due to having lied so long in misery and want. Um, he would not be exchanged for another officer, which was quite a common practice, and therefore he remained in imprisonment, in imprisonment and suffered much misery and want. Um, and he actually attempted to escape. And even though due to his escape, he got injured pretty badly, um, his wife nonetheless believed that he died because of the imprisonment rather than the fact that he um, got horribly crushed, essentially, as he was trying to escape. It, it, there's, there's just a lot of examples of people claiming that imprisonment was a great damage on them. Um, there are examples in Ireland as well. Um, Elizabeth Jay's husband was kept three weeks in extreme misery. Um, he was threatened daily with death. Um, and he languished and died there within three months. And of course, this is not unexpected. People petitioning for relief would like to emphasize that, they, that their loved ones went through um, horrible things. Um, and if you're a soldier yourself, you'd like to emphasize your bravery too. Um, Philip George was um, taken prisoner and evilly treated. Um, he was he was kept from before Christmas until Easter. He claimed he was unmercifully handled and burnt in all of his limbs for not disclosing great concerns of Hereford. Um, Philip did not state whether he was in a, in a position to have any secrets um, that he knows, um, uh, but his claim that he was faithful in keeping these secrets suggests that, that he was must have been. Um, and although torture to the extent that a person loses feeling in their limbs um, was and remains cruel, torture to extract relevant information was not understood to breach the laws of war. And to some people today, uh, it's still the truth. Uh, torture is still OK. Um, Philip's imprisonment um, in the petition illustrates two of the most important points that the justices would have looked for. It's proof of faithful service, um, wounding in service, 
and um, an example of, of being um, loyal to the crown. And although he, he mentioned imprisonment for a reason to show his loyalty, uh, very often imprisonment was listed as just another thing that soldiers experienced. It, it was nothing special. Um, this is actually due to petitioners understanding that the system would be more generous to them if they list the vast achievements rather than just listing every single thing that happened to them. Um, the justices would have already known that people would get put in prison during war. It, it's, it's, it, it's not a huge deal, so to say. And after death and illness, there was also much monetary loss that came with it, um, as most of us will know. In early modern prisons, people had to provide for themselves. Um, and there are plenty of examples of um, uh, wives claiming that they had to provide for their husbands. So if your husband had been in prison for four months, often their wives had to, for example, sell their clothes to be able to um, feed their husbands while they were imprisoned. And as common as and, and cruel as these situations were, um, they were not at all unlawful. Um, the majority of experiences described were within uh, the laws of war. Um, they remained lawful even if they were cruel and excessive. And so, of course, murder is, is slightly more difficult to justify under laws of war. Um, Richard Parker wrote that he was taken prisoner by the enemy. Um, he tried to escape, but then he was taken again and condemned to be hanged due to his actions. It, it's quite an epic uh, petition as he describes this this long journey to, um, uh, I suppose, being reborn is, is the way he describes it. Um, he, he claims that he only survived because the hanging rope broke and he pretended to be dead. And even though murder was obviously intended, um, and it must have been a horribly traumatic experience. Um, it was still awful um, because death was a very, uh, an appropriate punishment um, for attempting to escape. And this would have been in most um, handbooks uh, under the you know, imprisonment section. Um, essentially, the only uh, English or Welsh petition that mentions murder um, came from a man who described his captain's murder rather than, you know, a wife describing her husband's. Um, and his captain's death must have um, affected him in, in, in quite a uh, strong way, I suppose, as he would. Um, but also the reason that he mentioned his captain's death is most likely because um, he needed a, a more superior person to sign his petition to prove that he was a good and large soldier. So if the person who would sign your petition is dead, um, you need to come up with an, ex uh, with an explanation as to why they cannot uh, provide any evidence. So he was probably both um, quite upset by his captain's death, but also used it um, to his own advantage. Um, but this is obviously not to say that murder did not happen in imprisonment. Soldiers could not petition if they were dead. Um, and we know various instances of infamous murder, um, such as the retaliatory killings of soldiers in Shropshire. Um, this was between um, uh, Colonel Thomas Mitten and uh, 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 Prince Rupert. But there's also a quite a clear lack of widows describing unlawful uh, rather than simply neglectful actions, um, which I think supports the idea that lives were generally spared in these conflicts. Um, the lives are not valued or respected, um, but the notorious murders in captivity, which I just mentioned, uh, were notorious because of their rareness uh, and the breaches of the laws that most others followed um, in civil wars in England and Wales. Um, it, it, it was just unusual. Uh, in terms of the Irish depositions, um, there are plentiful examples of murder in, in captivity, so it, it's a bit easier to, for me to explore it on its on its own. Um, so Elizabeth Crooker, for example, was taken into captivity um, uh, with many people and claimed that some 15 of them were hanged and the rest were turned away and endured many misery and cold in the particularly cold winter of 42. 
Um, but even if there were no murders recorded in Irish depositions, uh, much imprisonment in Ireland was potentially unlawful by its very nature. Uh, women and children were imprisoned quite regularly, as were elderly people. Um, there are some examples on the slide here, such as Margaret Bycroft and her two children, although they are um, uh, their ages are not specified. Um, and we know that children sometimes could have been uh, well into their 20s, but from the context of this deposition, it does appear that they were um, actual young children. And Bells was kept in prison with six children, two of whom starved in that prison. And, and in the case of Elizabeth Jay, the whole family was imprisoned. Uh, seven children, her mother-in-law, um, and then her husband um, was killed. Um, so there can be no doubt that the imprisonment of family members had a great impact of people at home in all of the kingdoms. Um, it is evident from previous discussion of law, lawful imprisonment. Um, it was lawful, but it was cruel, and it had a huge impact on families. But only Irish Protestant narratives provide us with rich examples of women and children's experiences in captivity. Um, the same cannot be found in England or Wales. And as I said at the beginning, um, this divergence can be explained by the fact that the depositions were collected to inform on the early years of the rebellion. Um, this was before the initial insurgency settled into more conventional warfare. Uh, once the war in Ireland, um, once the war in Ireland was slightly more standardised, I suppose, um, it was fought more in line with the codes of conduct that both Owen Roe O'Neill and the Scottish commander Robert, Robert Monroe would have learned as professional soldiers in mainland Europe. Um, rules were also kept by other returning soldiers in England and Wales also, um, even if the armies were largely untrained. Um, it's very unfortunate that we do not have any such sources for the Catholics in Ireland. Um, nevertheless, it is clear that even if the English press did exaggerate the stories of um, or numbers of vulnerable people being hurt in Ireland, um, civilians in England and Wales did not ever face violence, um, especially captivity, um, that would be in any way comparable. Um, and so whilst these sources are difficult to compare directly, um, the accounts offer us insight into the application of laws of war um, and perhaps more importantly, uh, give us a glimpse of narratives through which uh, these were com uh, conveyed. So, as I said, some people are used it as just a standard thing that happens to every soldier and others made quite a big deal out of it. Um, and although English and Welsh men's experiences in captivity were almost always lawful, um, the narratives through which they or their wives spoke of them nonetheless betrayed feelings of misery and anguish, um, as well as the acknowledgement that although imprisonment did not always mean death, um, it was nonetheless a part of fighting for the cause of the King of Parliament, um, which they readily used for gaining financial help. Um, so as I said, if even if lives of soldiers were not valued in wartime, um, they were still spared. Um, I do not think that this means that the wars were civil um, uh, or that this evidence contradicts, contradicts any research on atrocity. Um, rather, I think that more um, ordinary narratives from ordinary people should be understood um, in the context of um, the wars and they should be explored as part of this area of research um, alongside the more, more infamous equivalents. Thank you. Thank you, Arrested, for that really interesting um, insight into sort of, I guess, what's considered appropriate in wartime and what's sort of accepted in wartime, especially when we've got such highly personal sources, which kind of, you know, offer insights into what people thought, regardless of the sort of legal status of what was going on. So we're going to go straight on to Lucy's paper now, uh, which I will start sharing. Um, Lucy is a first year PhD student at the University of Sheffield and her thesis Single Men and Manhood in Early Modern England aims to uncover the lived experiences of bachelors and widowers in contrast to their cultural representations from 1650 to 1750. 
At the PJR series here tonight, she will speak to us about historic and current events to calculate the exact number of bachelors and widowers living in England at the end of the 17th century. So, I will pass over to you. Just use the arrow keys, yeah. right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for having me here at UEA tonight. Um, in my PhD, I'm studying the lives of bachelors and widowers, how singleness affected their identities as men. The central question in my research is whether bachelors and widowers were perceived as less than their married counterparts, and if so, how and where did this manifest? I started my PhD in February 2021, so it is possible I won't be able to answer all of your questions at this time, but I'll be very grateful for any feedback and I'll certainly take any questions I can't answer into consideration. Uh, I want to take a moment at this time to establish what bachelor and widower actually meant in the early modern period. It isn't too different from today, but there are some noticeable caveats. Bachelors were men who had never been married before. Crucially, bachelors became socially prominent once they reached the age of 25, as this was the age at which the body's humours were thought to balance, making a youth suitable for marriage, at which point he would become an adult man. The average age of marriage was very high in England throughout the early modern period, and at the turn of the 18th century, it was about 27 years old. This means that most men experienced at least a short period of temporary bachelorhood. Widowers, then as now, were men whose marriage had been ended by the death of his wife. The term widower had only been in use since the 14th century, and it is very unusual in that it is derived from the more common female form of the word. Throughout the 17th and 18th century, it was only used in the period between the death of the first wife and the assumed inevitable marriage to the second wife. However, it does appear that by the 18th century, it was expected that a man would observe a period of mourning of about 12 months before he would seek to marry again. Men who remarried within that period were not legally condemned, but the fact that the newspaper magnate John Dunton felt the need to issue a public statement after his early remarriage gives the impression of social pariahdom. Together, I'll refer to bachelors and widowers as single men, but I have to stress that singleness was conditional to marriage only. Many of the single men that I have and will look at in my PhD had children, large families and servants, and a notable few had extramarital, romantic and sexual relationships. They may have been single, but they weren't alone. Single men interest me firstly because of their non-normative social position, but secondly because they are mostly passed over by the existing historiography. Historians and early modern people more widely assume that marriage is an inevitability and therefore current research on the topics of gender and family can either wholly engage with marriage or wholly disengage with marriage, allowing single men to slip through the cracks. We see this from the earliest works on masculinity in the early modern period, where Elizabeth Foister's excellent book on male marital identities completely excludes unmarried men, beside the single line, there were men for whom marriage was not a possibility. This minimising attitude is still seen in the small but emerging case of work that explicitly focuses on single men's lives. For example, in John McCurdy's book, Citizen Bachelors, he argues that early America's unusually imbalanced gender ratio and its developing libertarian values gave bachelors a highly viable social position in the politics of the day. However, due to this uniquely visible identity, he claims that all single men were bachelors and he does not provide any explanation for how widowers would fit into such a structure. While single men are elided by current research practices, single women have been treated to a far fairer and more nuanced study. Amy Freud established that differences in marital status led to differences in the treatment of women in her 2005 book, Never Married. She proved that women who had never married and women who were presently or had previously been married were legally distinct and that so greater social support was offered to married women and widows. Her work is why I have chosen to examine bachelors and widowers alongside and in comparison to each other. Not only do single identities need to be contrasted to marital identities, but also different single states must be compared. Thus, the question arises, if single men are not present in the historiography, how can they be found in the historical record? Historians of early modern Britain will already know that biographical records from the period often lack detailed information, usually prioritising occupational status over other personal descriptors. While women might be identified as widows or spinsters in legal documents as an explanation for why they possessed land, which would by right be given up to their husband if they had one, the same cannot be said of single men. 
In England, single men had exactly the same rights and social freedoms as their married counterparts. A man's ownership of certain items or possession of land was not in itself indicative of marital status. This had caused significant problems for recent works, such as in David Hussey and Margaret Ponsonby's book, The Single Homemaker. This book was intended to focus on single men and women. However, they found that their analysis of probate records ultimately meant that the vast majority of men who died without spouse are likely to be overlooked. So far, I have found one precious source. <laughs> I really wish I hadn't written this down to read out. I have found one precious source which establishes the demographic presence of single men in early modern England. It's called An Act for Granting His Majesty Certain Rates and Duties Upon Marriages, Births and Burials and Upon Bachelors and Widowers for the term of five years for carrying on the war against France with vigour. Most historians refer to this as the marriage duty assessment. The marriage duty assessments were unique in that they privileged descriptions of marital status over occupational status for both household heads and other household residents and for both men and women. The assessments were introduced in 1695 to run until 1700 to raise funds for the Nine Years War. When the Nine Years War ended in 1697, Parliament voted to continue the assessments until 1706. The assessments were dual pronged. Firstly, a fee had to be paid upon the instance of every birth, marriage or death. Anglicans and nonconformists alike had to pay this duty, regardless of whether their religious practices were legitimised under English law. Secondly, every bachelor and widower without children had to pay a yearly duty until their marriage, although exemptions were made for those who received arms and for those whose professions disallowed marriage, such as collegiate deans and some clerics. The amount of money due was scaled against personal wealth or the title of the individual, starting at one shilling per year for the very poorest men and reaching 12 pounds and five shillings per year for bachelor and widower dukes. To collect these fees and duties, relevant proofs of births, deaths and marital status had to be made. In each parish, commissioners were appointed to go to each house and record the householder's name, the number of other household residents, and their relation to the head of the household. These relationship descriptors were very basic, wife, child, servant, apprentice or lodger. While not comparable to the introduction of the formal census in 1851, these records certainly constitute a more than adequate proto-census of the late 17th century population. Or rather, it would be an adequate proto-census if the records had actually been made. The combination of an already strained legal infrastructure the ongoing economic changes caused by the financial revolution and the public's reluctance to pay fees for participating in normal life cycle events made the assessments almost impossible to afford, enforce. It is not that these records have been damaged or lost over time, but rather that the assessments were simply not carried out in many areas. This is evidenced by the very small amount of money that the assessments raised. William III had been given a loan of £650,000 against the value of the marriage duty assessment, but in 1698, the Flying Post newspaper reported that only £2,000 had been raised by the assessments in that year. A petition discussed in Parliament at that time suggested that the money raised was not even paying off the loan that had been given to William. However, the failure to implement the assessments nationwide does not necessarily mean that the assessments had failed. It appears that the assessments had a secondary purpose as an act of national demography. The political arithmetician Gregory King had worked closely with the House of Commons to make the materials to distribute that told the commissioners what they had to do at each house in the parish. And he used the assessment data from Litchfield and Gloucester to calculate that the English population was comprised of about five and a half million people a far more accurate estimate than those that had been carried out earlier in the 17th century. The level of data recorded in the assessments also allowed King to calculate the wealth of the nation per head and then in a display of explicit, explicitly nationalistic strength, compare that data to similar data from France and the Netherlands. Crucially, King wrote that since 1688, there had been a population dearth of about 55,000 people and that England was becoming younger than France, with about half of the English population being under the age of 20. King also found that about 10% of the total population was comprised of single men and women, meaning that one fifth of the potential breeding population was actually non-reproductive. 
Bachelors and widowers implicitly exemplified the English age problem as King estimated that the average age of a widower was 56 and the average age of a bachelor was 35. King's realist approach to these figures led him to conclude that the Nine Years' War would be unsustainable past 1698, not only financially, but because, the, because England would not be able to supply or replenish a viable amount of fighting men. In an attempt to corroborate King's findings, as well as to provide figures comparable to the demographic studies of widows and single women, as undertaken by historians like Richard Wall, I've decided to take a broader brush approach to my own research. I've examined the marriage duty assessments from 42 parishes to create a sample that co covers rural, provincial and urban parts of England. Six of these parishes were in Derbyshire, 18 in Bristol and 18 in London. Only one of these parishes, Tibshelf in Derbyshire, had year on year returns. This resulted in an overall population sample of 37,445 people. 1,221 of which were single men. I'm not going to talk too long about these statistics as they don't translate well in a spoken format, but please feel free to ask questions about this afterwards. I would just like to share three pertinent facts that I have so far found. When examining the data region by region, um, single men made up between 6 to 13% of all heads of households in the assessment, whereas single women made up 10 to 16% of all heads of household. When using the same regional data, but looking at single men within the total population, including, for example, adult children, resident kin, servants or lodgers, single men formed between 2 and 6% of England's total population, um, whereas single women formed 3 to 5% of England's total population. Although King did not separate single men from single women in his work, on the surface, my findings do appear markedly similar to what he calculated at the time. From this data, I have found that there were more single women in the early modern English population than single men, but men were more likely to be the household head with one major exception. Uh, nearly 80% of the bachelors in London were not listed as the head of the household. More than half of this 80% um, were listed as lodgers in the homes of non were listed as lodgers in the homes of people that they did not share a blood relationship with. From data like this, I begin to understand the impact of regional factors which might increase or decrease the number of single men in any given area. Currently, I'm working towards making some meaningful calculations of the average household size and the most common household structures for bachelors and widowers. And then I will expand on this work um, to taking a small sample of single men and um, following their lives through other archival records to create case studies. As well as the very rich demographic data that the assessments provide, contemporary reactions to the assessments also provide insight into the social and cultural attitudes towards single men that were prevalent at the time. Bachelors and widowers were the only group that were forced to make yearly contributions towards the assessments and therefore the Commons blamed single men when the assessments were not a financial triumph. Debate in April 1698 suggests that single men were actually abusing the terms of the assessments, firstly because they do not pay according to their quality, and secondly because there was a frequent removal of persons liable to pay the duty. The proposed solution of creating a catalogue of all known bachelors and widowers was summarily rejected, but the dual implication that single men were likely to lie about their personal wealth or were so unattached from their communities that they could simply pack up and leave whenever they wished, uh, did not appear to be particularly objectionable to any of the members of parliament who were attending in the Commons that day. Other reactions to the assessments from texts from the period also served to other and blame single men for various problems in English society. In the levellers, two women discussed their desire to marry and the reasons that they cannot find suitable grooms. Thus, the assessments are brought up and they point out that the fees paid on each marriage and birth were greater than the yearly duty for remaining a bachelor, accidentally giving men a financial incentive to remain single, which the two debaters believe to be a highly undesirable state. I would like to read from the whole text as these women's solution to what they perceive as a growing reluctance among men to marry is not only hilarious, but surreal and extremely misandrist. Although the tone of the text falls within the genre of marriage satire, 
The author certainly gives the impression that they unironically hate unmarried men. I will quote at length one passage now. A bachelor is a useless thing in the state. Having no family, he cannot be reckoned a good Commonwealth's man. And if he is not a good one, then he is a bad one. A bachelor of age has broken the laws of nature. Increase and multiply is the command of nature and of the God thereof. Now having broken the laws of nature, he ought not to have any protection of the laws of England because a bachelor contributes little or nothing to the support of our freedoms. The money he pays in taxes is inconsiderable to the supplies given by others in children, which are addition to the native strength of our kingdom. From this text and the slightly later dialogue between a bachelor, a widower and a married man, complaints about the ass assessment seem to centre around the belief that single men saw paying the duty essentially as a form of permission to remain single. This text male centred perspective aligns it more with the traditional marriage satire. The bachelor and the widower wish to remain single because they dislike women while the married man attempts to convince them to marry. The bachelor goes as far to state that I think it is better to pay for living a bachelor than to be troubled and plagued with a bad wife as many are. Their debate is then ended with an abridged copy of the popular poem, The Pleasures of a Single Life, which follows the story of a man who divorces his wife and disowns his children to return to his youthful passion for books and quiet contemplation. Depending on your reading, this poem could be taken as a serious advocation for bachelorhood or as a criticism of the nostalgia for youth. Regardless, this poem juxtaposes permanent singleness with marriage. They are not opposites, but rather entirely different states of being. While the assessments did not achieve their primary goal of financing a war with France, the acceptance of the idea that the male reproductive ability held an explicit monetary value is a striking objectification in the most literal sense. The assessments made single men objects of taxation, and when that didn't work, single men became objects of scorn and ridicule. What effect this had on single men, I hope to follow up on in my further research. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Lucy. And your PhD sounds such an exciting, as exciting project. And if you've only just started it, I really hope you can hope to redress that kind of lack of focus we've had on single men who are such an important part of the demographic. It's so strange, but there we go. Um, I'd like to welcome both of our speakers to come back up, actually, because then we can take questions together. Um, let's just stop that one. So, uh, oh. There we go. So yes, if we have any, I know we've got questions in the chat box. So I said if the online group can type their questions into the chat and I'm happy to read them out. Um, people in the room, we were able to pick up your questions on the recording last time. So if you speak loudly and clearly, we should still be able to do that. Um, I think we've already got a question from Danny who got one in early for Arresta. So we'll start with Danny's question. Do you think the level of cruelty alleged over imprisonment in Ireland was worsened as Parker has suggested by the extreme weather facing the Little Ice Age? Was there, as Andy Hopper suggested, in Soldiers and Strangers, an active attack on Celtic peoples as well worthy of massacre as at Farndon Field? I'm sure that means more to you, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll let you answer. Um, so I guess I have quite um, several questions. So Parker did suggest that, the, obviously, as we know, there was a little ice age in the 17th century that made um, everything worse. Um, um, I don't know about the ideas on imprisonment, um, but it is a definitely a fact that um, a lot of the accounts recall women and children fleeing in the middle of winter, um, which was a really bad one even for the 17th century, and a lot of children and, and women and so on perished uh, in the cold because often they were stripped of their clothes, um, either to be robbed for, her, for the little things that they had or just simply to humiliate them. Um, and I assume that starvation would have been worse for them as well. There are some accounts where in an imprisonment, um, the, the Protestants were obviously not fed properly. Um, some of them survived off just simply eating um, little grasses that they could find in, in the yard that they could reach from the house that they were imprisoned in. So I'm sure that um, uh, the, the horrible winter made their experience much worse. So if, if there was any fruit to eat, there wasn't any more by the time the winter came. And in terms of Andy's suggestion, um, active attack on Celtic peoples. Um, oh, I think that there was a, a definite attack on Celtic people, um, but I, I would tend to agree with the Irish scholars who 
um, argue that um, I don't really know about Scotland, but in terms of Ireland, I would agree with the idea that um, th there was a lot of butchery and massacre in, in, in places like Ireland. Um, however, it was not indiscriminate. Um, it, it wasn't particularly restrained either, um, but it certainly wasn't um, quite as extreme as some people um, have suggested. Um, but, but this is, of course, not to minimise the, the, the horrible stuff that ha that's happened to them. Um, but. I'm not sure whether it was a, a sort of a, a wholesale massacre or such. Thank you. I hope, Danny, that was all right with you. Uh, any questions either either in the chat box? Or I have a question for Arrester, actually. Lucy has a question for Arrester. <laughs> yes. um, you know, you said that Catholic people were targeted and not seen to be deserving of the, like, laws against torture and stuff, yeah. like you could just kill them. Yeah. Was there, sorry, that sounded really <laughs> awful. Um, was there the sort of false identification of yes. Catholic people? Like, oh, I thought he was a Catholic, yes. so I killed him. Um, there was always that. Um, a lot of the, in one of the infamous killings I mentioned, um, a lot of the supposedly Irish soldiers were just mistaken. A lot of them were Welsh, some of them were Scottish, some of them may have been Irish, but anyone foreign was Irish and therefore Catholic and therefore dead. Um, similarly with a lot of women who may have followed uh, English people or Welsh people, you know, camp followers. Um, some more violent women were often identified as Irish and killed as well, um, because there's um, almost nothing worse than an Irish woman um, at the time. So that was pretty bad. Um, Thanks. I have one for Lucy. Oh, <laughs> we'll start with Ollie, yeah. Um, what made uh, someone like um, Bachelor, um, what made him, what was ideal for a woman in order to, so that he would be a suitable candidate for marriage? Oh, so like in the Levellers pamphlet. Is there like a A tick list. Terrible, yeah. Is there sort of a problem where if you are not a homeowner and you are listed as a lodger, you're probably not deemed worthy of marriage because you do not own a home and therefore perhaps you're then stuck in Situation. Yeah, so my personal thought about the really high number of bachelor lodgers in London is that it kind of indicates a more junior position. So they're not yet established in business. They're probably not making that much money. Of course, because the wealth of people is recorded, you do see some bachelors who have £600 of personal wealth or they make more than £50 a year. That's like one of the wealth level cutoffs. So there's people above that amount and below that amount. And at the minute, I'm looking at people's wills to see how much these people actually made. Because, you know, if you had five, this is one of the potential abuses. You could have five hundred and ninety nine pounds and be like, well, I don't have six hundred pounds, so I don't have to pay the next level of the assessment. Um, in the levelers, the women who were so desperate to get married, one of the problems is the is something that we now seem to associate more with the later 18th century or the 19th century in that they say they want to marry men and there's men everywhere who are single but men are starting to expect bigger dowry payments from women and also the, these are like middle class women in this debate obviously they're supposed to be you know educated or whatever so they they give the impression that they're quite well off these fictional women um they say they find it demeaning to marry men with a uh, like a lesser heritage so there are more wealthy men around but they don't have that cultural background which is you know something that maybe we associate now with like pride and prejudice or something like that um so is even the, 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 something that when i'm looking at these men's diaries this is what i'm going to do in the future but from the few that i've looked at so far a lot of them are desperate to get married and they do feel like a cultural pressure to get married. All my friends are married, they're having children and I'm not. Um, and it just like isn't working out for them for whatever reason. So I do hope to nail that down a bit more beyond the obvious like financial oppression. Thanks. I can see Danny's online question, but we'll come to Joel first. <laughs> Thank you both. I really enjoyed that. It's great to see two of our former students thriving elsewhere. It's really lovely to see you both here about your work. 
because Lucy's only had one question and the rest is two, I'm going to ask Lucy a question. Okay. What she just said, which made me think about um, when you were talking about bachelors and like the age in which you become a bachelor officially. And I suppose before that, you're in, you're in this other realm that probably includes a number of things, but you have terms like apprentice and so forth. A lot of the jest literature from the time that focuses on these young males is very often anti-marriage. Yeah. And celebrates single male yeah. life. And I just wonder, like, is it like, is there an actual switch in the brains of males that like, oh crap, I gotta get married now? Or or how you know, where do we join those up? It is really interesting because to an extent 25 is essentially to us now it's completely arbitrary like why why we are humans balanced at 25 in a post humoral society it makes almost no sense um we and this is something that alexandra shepherd's a big proponent of and because that comes from she's obviously looking at cambridge and so by the age of 25 you've decided if you're going to stay in the college in which case you couldn't marry or you're going to leave the college and go into a line of profession where you could marry which is why possibly it's higher than that 25 being the age of an adult man is possibly higher than what we would see today um as far as the like culture of anti-marriage satire it's so hard at least for me to put my finger on what the early modern sense of humor actually is like when you read an anti-marriage satire you're like, wait, is this pro-marriage or is it anti-marriage? Is it funny that these people think it's funny to not get married? So it's kind of like, I don't know, brain worms, some of them. Um, but there are, there is a really good article about the poem, The Pleasures of a Single Life by James Rosenheim. And he argues that this poem is like really integral to bachelors gaining a more kind of viable footing in society because instead of this jest book like, huh, I hate women, so I'm not gonna get married. He's saying, I'm leaving my wife because I prefer reading, quiet contemplation, solitude. And so it's more, although it's you know disrespectful to divorce your wife and disown your children, he's returning to a respectful form of life that can't really be criticized. So, that James Rosenheim argues that that's like really important in making bachelorhood normal in the 18th century moving forward. I suppose that's more related to the civilizing process or the polite society model, which I don't. That's a, <laughs> my thoughts on the civilizing progress is for a different time, I suppose. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just read out Danny's follow up question. Uh, which I think is for Lucy again. Are there any similar de demographic data that can be found in other European nations that you can use as a point of comparison with Britain? Um, I actually think there is in Spain because this is something that a lecturer said to me at Sheffield. Um, people coming into the ports of Spain as merchants and things had to say if they were married or not. And so she's said potentially I could use that data as a point of comparison between England and Spain, but I haven't looked into it more than being told about it. Any more questions? I have a very simple, probably quite an annoying question you must get all the time. Um, in terms of material on the the poor man and the rich man and the, the middling sort man, um, is there a huge difference? Are, uh, are your sources concentrated on one half more so than the other? Obviously, if, if there's is substantial diaries and they must have been a slightly more well off and, and, and is there any way that you try to fix this inequality, I suppose? Um. Um, yeah, I suppose the diaries and things that do exist lean more towards the middling sort, the very elite. There's like such a low rate of marriage among elite people in England in the okay. 18th century that it's like not weird to not get married. That's interesting. Yeah. And then middling sort people, they, you know, kind of actively want to seek out marriage um, because it can help better their career and things. So they're quite keen to record that even in, for example, working books. There's a, a wig maker called Edmund Harold, who is like really pursuing his neighbor, a widow, 
because she has a bigger shop than him. And he's like, <laughs> if we get married, I'm going to have a really big shop. Um, which doesn't work out because she knows that she uh, he only cares about the shop and not about her. Um, but to kind of remedy the fact that it skews towards middling sorts, that's why I'm using these wills and other archival yeah. records, because uh, by the 18th century, we even see servants leaving wills that's and cool. leaving very small amounts of money to people. But that that those records do exist in some places. Yeah, that's good to know. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the two lovely papers. Um, question for Lucy about talking about this kind of demographic argument about you know you need to do your kind of do the service for your country by not being bachelors and going getting a wife and having kids. I mean obviously this is very acute around the time of these you know turn of the century. But further in your is it 1650 or 1750s? Yeah. When wars kind of further away, is that still the argument or does the argument shift? I would say it's definitely a big point of contention specifically at this time. Yeah. And it's something that people are really worried about, that England's population is, is very young because so many people died in the wars and then of the plague and then in this war. And then there's probably going to be another war after this war. So it's like a very it's like a crisis point when England might be totally sub uh, invaded and subsumed by France. So is this just, is this more of a paranoia thing, which is then to um, the bachelors? I, I think it could be that they're kind of being singled out because that the language that they use at the time is, is very of that, you're not contributing to society. So, you know, these bachelors could be great charitable figures. They could have, they could be doctors, you know, doing great service to their community, but that is completely being ignored in favour of their ability to reproduce. So, to me, that's very interesting. Um, uh, Arrested, sort of headed your uh, talk out with um, mentions of like conduct manuals for, for war. Um, I've had a couple of questions about them. So, um, depending on where they were produced, so there's wars in Germany and obviously more domestic matters as well. Are there, are there quite large discrepancies in these manuals or are they all sort of followed roughly the same track? Um, I couldn't really tell you about the, the continental ones because I've not looked at them, embarrassingly. Um, but the ones that do exist for Ireland slightly later on. Um, and the ones that exist in England and, and some in Scotland, um, they all seem to be pretty much the same. Um, there are some very minor differences, but there's always a, a desertion is a crime, killing prisoners is a crime, and then you report to uh, your immediate um, superior for this and this and this. They're very, very similar. Um, so the, the rules that, that were written down were generally almost identical and very, very minor differences between them. And then uh, who, who would be reading? Managed because presumably, you know, an average soldier would be carrying a copy. Um, so, uh, I mentioned briefly that there were many professional sol soldiers returning from uh, from various conflicts in Europe, so they would have been educated um, there. So, so they would have borrowed a lot of um, their understandings. Um, but there are uh, obviously handbooks made in England as well. Um, we have no idea about Wales because there is no. Um, there's no records left about whether these were printed in Wales. Um, assumption is that it was not printed in Wales, and if it was, it wouldn't have been in Welsh. Um, so the general idea, I think, is that um, the more superior people uh, within the groups would read these out, out loud. Um, and in Wales, um, people who spoke both languages would translate this into Welsh. Um, it's important to remember that a lot of the soldiers are conscripts. <coughs> Um, some of them volunteers, so a lot of them would not have had any training whatsoever. Um, and, and so armies on both sides relied on the more experienced people to teach the people on route to war. Um, so the handbooks were usually read out, and uh, but, but they would have made sure that um, no soldier has an excuse of saying, oh, I didn't know that the handbook said this. It was always in force. We're going to go back to online group for a question from Natalie. Uh, he has a question for Lucy. She says, thank you both for brilliant papers as well. Um, Lucy, are you expecting to see a change in attitude towards single men over time? And can you see any significant changes in the numbers of single men over time? Or is it not really possible to determine this from sort of patchy records? Um, so demographically, I am very reliant on 
this um, marriage duty assessment and all of the records that I use come from 1695 to 1699. So I haven't even been able to find records that were taken in the later period, the sort of renewal period of the marriage duty assessment. Um, I don't expect to find more demographic data of this type for the future. Um, people's wills increasingly list whether they were a bachelor or widower later into the 18th century, but I also don't want to do a thesis that's just about people's wills. So, uh, <laughs> so I probably will not emphasize the demographic aspect in the second and third chapters. Um, as far as attitudes changing over time, culturally in books from the period, like entertainment from the period, we do, it, different attitudes can be seen and these, especially for bachelors, they have already been talked about extensively, but perhaps not in this, the sense that these stereotypes of people weren't married. So if you think about rakes, mollies and fops, those are three bachelor stereotypes which were very prolific in the 18th century and especially after the 1720s. Um, and then there's something slightly more unusual in the early 17th century, which is the disconsolate widower trope, um, which is when you really cry at your wife's funeral, but you're doing it for pity and not because you're actually sad that your wife's dead, um, which was a really, really popular stereotype. And at the start of the talk, I mentioned John Dunton's public statement that he releases that he married four months after his wife died in that he calls himself a disconsolate widower and so that's very interesting because he's saying that he's sad that his wife's died but not that sad <laughs> so <laughs> which seems very inconsiderate today um so and this that the disconsolate widower trope i haven't seen it after like 1710 so it, it definitely drops off. It's not in, doesn't seem to be present in the popular literature anymore after that. Thank you. So we'll come back to Joel. Um, oh, we've got to ask first. Oh no. <laughs> um, I love the project and the focus on prisoners is like a great way to think of, and, and to develop this sort of existing sort of dialogue about what's, what's going on and, 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 and war. But I want to ask one of those really annoying questions about terms. Which I hate myself. Yeah. Um, you you used like terms like unlawful killing. You use murder. It's like how do you apply these terms? Are you know yourself as a historian writing of the past, and also how are they used at the time? Are people talking about murder because you know killing someone in the context of war? You were talking about like you were using murder, but for what might be considered in the laws of war, a just killing you know, almost like the application of the laws of war. So like, how do you deal with all those terms and like, what do they mean? Um, I generally tend to just use the terms that make sense to me rather than the early modern people. Um, so if I see as a murder, I will call it a murder, I suppose. Um, but most of most of the sources will call the murders. Um, some will call killings, um, but, but I suppose it's, it's sort of up to me to decide whether it was lawful or not. Um, but there doesn't seem to be any specific term that contemporaries would have used. So some of them will say it's a killing, some of them uh, say it's a murder, some of them just say that they died, even though it's quite clear that they were killed. Um, so I think it probably depends on what they wanted to emphasize. Um, and then another thing that I come across is the fact that some people really argue that I should not be using prisoner of war to talk about something so early, um, which I do not really understand um, because well, Pris cool. Yeah, <laughs> prisoner <laughs> taken in war is a prisoner of war. Uh, however, I, I, um, I'm kind of trying to decide what to call civilians who are imprisoned, um, especially as uh, I'm not sure everyone would agree that um, the 1641 rebellion at the beginning was a war after all. So I think in my thesis, I mainly call them civilian, civilian captives, um, detainees. Um, it, it, it's a good question and something that I've not thought enough about. Um, I need to figure out the vocabulary. But another thing that has been brought up in the recent atrocity uh, literature is the idea that we need 
a term that's sort of equivalent for, you know, how some things are, uh, you know, someone gets killed or someone gets murdered. Um, recent books suggest that we need a term for um, massacre is when you uh, murder a bunch of people on purpose, but we need a word for killing a lot of people on purpose. So killing a bunch of people in a lawful way. Um, so no one has come up with that term. <laughs> for killing people in a lawful way. Do you mean like starving them or like? No, as in if 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 a town does not surrender, oh. then by laws of war, you mm. are allowed to kill everyone in the town. Okay. So you would call that a massacre probably. Yeah. But because it's lawful, mm. it feels like you need a term that's of a separate a, word. A separate yeah. word for lawful. Yeah. Uh, atrocity, massacre, killing. Yeah. The same one we have kill and murder. Yeah. Um, which. I wonder because you because you're working with those civilians as well. Whether I mean, do you, do you have a sense that they might be using this sort of using these terms, murder, killing, maybe even execution? If that's something that, that they use, using those terms in the way that a civilian might, right? So murder would, would, in a, is a legal word, right? <laughs> and, and, and it's a crime. Yeah. Um, killing in the act of war, well, that could just be the act of war. You know, whereas murder seems to be quite different, and then execution. I mean, like we might think of execution as like, you know, an executed style murder, like a really bad thing today. But I suppose that they would probably use that word in the most in, in most instances as a strict legal act, i.e., you were executed because you had committed something that des deserved execution, as a, as opposed to you know a modern way that, that's more flexible about that. I just wonder whether 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 you know, people use murder basically pejoratively, like um, it's a murder, it's a bad thing. Killing, eh. <laughs> I wish I wish that <laughs> um I, I wish that it was like a a certain way that everyone spoke, everyone had the same dictionary or something. Um, I, I think murder is probably a bit more common in the Irish depositions. Uh, most of the things that I use in this are from the early parts of the rebellion, as I said, and they tended to be more spontaneous accounts rather than the ones collected in the 50s when it was more for the for the law. Um, and then they might say murder, but I, I don't really care about those, to be fair. <laughs> um, okay. You don't care about those people? Uh, not sources. Um, I, I forgot what I said. Oh, yeah. Um, so, but sometimes people will say that someone was killed tyrannically. Um, so, so if someone really means that a killing was the bad kind, that they will add some sort of a, um, a adjective or an intensifier. So a lot of the time it, it really just says killed tyrannically, um, killed awfully. Um, uh, when men were being executed for trying to escape, it was never um, referenced to as an execution, always just a killing. Um, so, so I think overall murder is more of an Irish term, perhaps a bit more emotional. Uh, and and, and I, obviously, I don't want to guess why this is, but I assume that murder is. I saw my husband being murdered in front of me rather than my husband was skilled doing his job. It, That's it probably what it is. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it can be quite difficult with murder. Like I say, yeah, it's, it's pretty obvious that they mean that murder is the bad thing. <laughs> uh, with killings, it's more difficult to tell, like I say, because sometimes they just refer to killing as in something that happens, something that happens in war, killed, dead, same thing to do with some of the petitioners. Um, execution is never, ever, ever used. I've never seen it. Um, and I don't know whether this is because people don't see executions very much, which I doubt. Um, if you call it a murder, you are literally delegitimizing the act. True. You know, they may, they may, the Irish may see it as a legitimate act, right? <laughs> to their side. But you don't want to like give them that credit for like, this is an act of war, and therefore it's legitimate because we're, we're in war, or this is an act, you know, that might have some sort of way of moral, you know, all the atrocities that they, that, that the British, I suppose, to use that term, uh, might have been inflicting on the Irish. You don't want to legitimize any of that to say that their killing of you is, is the legitimate. So you can call them murder. I'm speculating. Yeah, uh, the like I say, I think murder is only used by Protestants who fleed for their lives. I think that's the only time I've ever seen it. 
um, otherwise it's just killing and, and died. And sometimes they're saying, oh, my husband died by having horrible wounds inflicted him. So, you know, he was hit on the head like 15 times and say so he died from that rather than saying they was killed by it. Um, so, so I think there's uh, various ways in which people deal with it, but I, I can't really find any real evidence of the language being more colourful on purpose. The only times it's more colourful in that way, as I say, is just when people say killed tyrannically. Um, it seems like those words did not have um, a huge weight to them at the time. I think that the way that they do now, um, I'm, I'm not sure, but it's interesting. It's interesting because killing seems very passive. When you're killed, it it's less, the way you died seems less important than if you were murdered. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's essentially just civilians who say murder. Mm. So my husband was murdered, um, my sister was murdered, and when it comes to widows and soldiers, they say he was killed, he mm. died. Sometimes killed tyrannically, but very, very rarely. Anyway, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions in the room or online? Yeah, I've got a question for Lucy. Hi, sorry. Um, have you seen any like geographical differences in terms of attitudes towards single men, you know, so like particularly in terms of looking at rural versus urban landscapes? Um, regional attitudes, not necessarily at the turn of the 18th century. There are a lot less single men in Bristol and I imagine that's because so many people worked in marine professions that if you weren't married, you know, going off to sea, it's not necessarily, you're not inconveniencing your like wife or children you know by going away to work at sea and then you might die at sea and possibly leave your wife and children behind uh, for example in london and derbyshire for every widower there's two widows whereas in bristol for every widower there's 10 widows um and so while i haven't seen any cultural attitudes about that at the time there is an article about sodomites in bristol by steve Poole. And he kind of argues that the high number of Quakers in Bristol in the 1730s and also the high number of unmarried men around the ports and store gave Bristol the reputation as like a gay city, in a, obviously in a bad way, um, which is really interesting. But his focus isn't, his focus is on the like homosexual sodomitical aspect of it and not necessarily on the unmarried male aspect of it like he's thinking about homosexuality in a very uh, like depersonalized way like the, atti the homophobic attitude towards Bristol at that time like Bristol as a general thing rather than individual men so hopefully I'll see that in my later chapters yeah that would be really good to be able to have an article that could like uh, back up what Steve Paul says because that was really interesting. Um, just a question for Arresta. You, you mentioned earlier some examples of very exciting, colourful stories of people ex escaping or trying to escape. Um, I suppose the question is, is, like, is it more honourable to stay a prisoner and wait it out or is it seems to be more honourable to try and escape? Uh, good question. I honestly have no idea. Because <laughs> um, I, I think in, in the petitions a lot of the time, the fact that they escaped um, it usually means that they have suffered in some way. So if they tried to escape, they may have, um, like one of the men who uh, who the captor saw had killed, they they hung him, but the, the, the rope broke and, and he survived miraculously. So when he went to petition, he said, oh, I survived miraculously. Um, and it, this is so amazing, give me some money for the suffering of, of me, you know, dying and then being brought back to life. That's how he understood it. Um, other men mentioned their escapes because, uh, like the example I mentioned, he, he broke most of his bones, essentially. Um, a, a lot of other men upon escaping have loads of different injuries. So, so I think it, the fact that they escaped or tried to escape um, is never really used as a form of loyalty or anything like that a lot of the times it's literally just to explain how they got certain injuries Mental yeah essentially yeah <laughs> i mean that was the purpose of it 
Um, it's less exciting when you turn up and say I sat for eight months. Yes, yeah, so it's a little less exciting, yeah. So they let me go, then I jumped out the window. Yeah. They, they, they usually don't say, oh, I was exchanged for a different officer because it's not very interesting and they will not get very much money for it. Um, and I, I, like I say, a lot of the time imprisonment was just mentioned as just another thing that happened. So if they're imprisoned without any of these exciting things, imprisonment will often come at the very end of the petition. They'll say, I served King like, and I was so loyal and so amazing. And um, I did all of these uh, amazing things. I, I served in three countries and at the end they say, by the way, I was in prison for 17 weeks. <laughs> it, it's just, if they have nothing exciting to say, that they just say, I was imprisoned and this is another thing I've done. So can I have money, please? Thanks. Any more questions? No. Nope. Online group, we got anything else to add? Um, no. Nope. No thanks. No? Okay. Well, thank you ever so much to our speakers. We give another round of applause because we're doing it. And now I will share the slides for our talks for next week. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, we've got clapping online for you as well. So. <laughs> um, so thank you everyone who joined us tonight. Uh, tomorrow evening we've got a, a UEA kind of special and a landscape history special. Uh, we've got Tom Lucking, he's actually joined us tonight, we can point to him and wave, um, who is going to be looking at reconstructing historic settlement and land use patterns in the East Anglian Breckland using archaeological and environmental evidence. And we're going to be welcoming back uh, Tom Breen, who did his PhD at UEA and has now gone on to do postdoc at Oxford Brooks. And he's going to be looking at finding footpaths, how maps are used as evidence of historic rights of way. So I hope you can join us next week. And thank you ever so much for coming this week. And thank you to our speakers. I will now end the recording and you can breathe. <laughs> <So>. <laughs>